So there's this saying that March comes in like a lion and out like a lamb. It's not going to take much to convince me there might be some truth to that statement. But have you ever really thought about where that saying comes from? Yeah, me neither. But it does make for a slam dunk elementary school art project. You know, gluing some cotton balls on a piece of construction paper. I'd like to think we're more creative than that. And we're going to need every ounce of creativity to overcome the medication shortage issues we've been facing. Coming up, we'll talk about the latest treatment updates, some tips on taking care of your own mental health, and a new treatment for STEMI patients called remote ischemic conditioning. I'm Dr. Peterson, we're with Oakdale Fire, and those are the three things you need to know. Hi, I'm Abe Campos, the Regions EMS Fellow. Today, we're going to be introducing a new protocol used for STEMI patients called Remote Ischemic Conditioning, also known as RIC. RIC is the process of intentionally causing short periods of ischemia to a remote part of the body during a myocardial infarction. For some reason, this results in cardioprotective effects that can limit the damage done by a heart attack. Any STEMI patient could potentially benefit from this, and there are really no downsides. Although the mechanism resulting in protective effects is not completely understood at this time, RIC has been studied in cardiology journals for over 20 years with some very positive results. Studies have shown that performing RIC during a STEMI can decrease the size of an infarct, decrease the risk for future major adverse cardiac events, as well as lower the troponin levels that we measure in blood tests to determine the severity of the heart attack. To perform this task, you'll need three simple things, a timer, a manual blood pressure cuff, and a time log. This can be performed by any provider at any training level. The inclusion criteria will include any patient with an SD elevation MI who is being transported for treatment to a cardiac cath lab capable facility. The protocol will involve inflating a blood pressure cuff to 200 millimeters of mercury on an upper extremity and leaving it inflated for a full five minutes. After five minutes, the cuff will be deflated. Each inflation and deflation sequence makes up one cycle. This process should be repeated four times if time allows. One thing to keep in mind is the need for pain control if the patient has any discomfort with the procedure. This is typically not a big concern and would be far outweighed by the protective benefits. Remote ischemic conditioning should not delay standard STEMI care, nor should it delay the time of transport of a patient to a cath lab capable facility. Some EMS agencies will have shorter transport times and may not be able to fully implement this protocol, which is okay. The region's ED and cath lab will continue the RIC procedure if started by EMS and is currently the only facility in the area to be doing this procedure. In summary, Remote ischemic conditioning is a simple procedure with minimal downsides and potentially significant benefit. Get it started for every STEMI patient you treat and let's raise the bar for the hospitals. All right, let's talk about some treatment updates that you need to be aware of. For kicks and giggles, I went through my med kit to figure out which medications have been on shortage recently to remind ourselves what the scope of the problem is we're facing. Unfortunately, this is going to be the new normal going forward. Remember last summer when we switched to D10 because of a shortage of D50? Well, guess what? Apparently the production didn't keep up, and now D10 is in short supply. This might be spotty over the next few months, so don't be surprised if D50 makes a temporary comeback. Just remember that you don't have to give the entire dose at once. Use some common sense, use oral sugar options when appropriate, and titrate your treatment. Most patients will only need a half dose of D50. Next up, you'll never believe this, but ketamine is facing a serious shortage. I would consider this a critical medication, so we need to be very careful with our supply. We should be conserving the ketamine for true excited delirium cases 
and use other medications when we can for other situations. Etomidate would be a great option for RSI induction, and let's just stick to opioids for pain medication until this shortage resolves. And finally, don't forget that there are other options to treat agitated patients if there is not an imminent safety issue. Intramuscular Haldol and Versed is still an effective combination. You just have to give it more time. Moving on, cardiac epinephrine is really nowhere in sight right now. Our pharmacy has been kind enough to make up epi kits with a 10 cc vial of saline for dilution. But as luck would have it, those saline vials are not available anymore. The easiest way to deal with this is to use a 10 cc saline flush syringe to draw up the epi. You don't even need to waste any saline. As long as we're diluting it at least tenfold from 1 to 1,000, it's okay. The point is that we can't give 1 to 1,000 epi into a vein. 1 to 10,000 is as low as we go. Good times, am I right? The final update for this month is related to stroke patients. Some recent research has shown benefits in treating certain stroke patients up to 24 hours after their symptoms start. This really expands our treatment window substantially but involves a slightly different workflow from the hospital side of things. For now, we're not asking you to change your pre-hospital treatment. Continue to identify the last known well time for patients with stroke symptoms, as this is the critical piece of information we will need. Within eight hours, activate a stroke code, just like you've been doing. Beyond eight hours, we aren't asking you to request a stroke code, but understand that all of the East Metro stroke hospitals are prepared to implement a modified version of a stroke team response for these extended timeframe patients. This workflow will probably evolve over the next few months and will definitely provide education as this works itself out. Springtime normally brings new life, fresh starts, and the end of hibernation season for the upper Midwest. You would think this would be good for our mental health, but the reality is that we actually see a spike in suicide attempts during the months of spring. These are always difficult calls to respond to, and one truth of public safety is that you can never unsee the things you've seen. We also know that public safety professionals unfortunately have a higher risk of suicide than the general public. We have to acknowledge this fact and take care of each other, and more importantly, ourselves. Steve Whitehead from EMS1.com produces a video series called Remember Two Things. In a recent episode, he discussed PTSD amongst public safety professionals and two simple things we can do to better take care of ourselves. Check this out. Dealing with traumatic incidents and the stress of an emergency service job is something all of us have to manage. However, two of the most effective coping mechanisms are also two of the most underutilized. I'll tell you about both of them on this episode of Remember Two Things. All of us have to manage and deal with the stress of our emergency service job. However, not all of us use all of the resources available to us. Recent research suggests that most of us don't even consider some of the most valuable resources that we have when we're trying to manage the stress of an emergency service job. There's a couple resources that I would like to implore you or encourage you to reach out to when you're trying to manage the ongoing day-to-day -day stress of your emergency service job. The first one is your spouse, significant other, or the most significant person in your life, that significant human connection that you have. You see, some of the recent research that was done suggested that almost 100% of emergency service personnel who responded to the survey said that they do talk to their coworkers about stressful jobs. They use that communication channel and that's great, it really is, it's a very effective channel. But only 37% of those surveyed 
said that they ever talked to their spouse or significant other about those same traumatic things that they go through. I think maybe some of the reason for that is we feel like we need to shelter or protect our family and significant others who are outside of emergency services from the things that we experience. But keep in mind, you don't have to give every single detail of the job or the call when you're talking about it. Talking about what occurred in general, but how it made you feel and what you may be struggling with after the fact is incredibly important. So reach out to that person. I think in most cases what you'll find is that if they love you, they want to be there for you and they want to have that conversation. The second resource that is chronically underutilized is professional help. And I definitely think the major reason that we avoid it is because we feel like one, there's a stigmatism attached to it. And also I think there's some bravado with an emergency service job that we are the helpers. We don't look for help. But imagine someone trying to learn the game of football or trying to learn to pitch a baseball and saying, oh, a coach? No, no, no. I don't need a coach. I don't need that kind of professional help. That's, that's a sign of weakness. If I go find a, a pitching coach, that's basically already admitting that I'm a weak pitcher. Or there's a problem with my pitching. No, no athlete would ever say that. In athletics, having a coach is just the obvious progression of advancing your skills. When you're struggling with stress, professional help is a life coach. That's what they're there for. Just like a sports coach, they're there to teach you skills and tools that you can utilize to manage a very stressful job. So the next time that you're thinking about how you should cope with the ongoing stress that all of us experience, I want you to consider a couple things. One, talk to that most significant person in your life, and two, consider talking to some professional help. I wanna thank you for watching. I'm Steve Whitehead for EMS Ones. Remember two things. Well, that's it for the March edition of Regions EMS Update. As we start thinking about warmer weather, check out our social media pages and send us some ideas for topics you'd like covered in the future. Also, we just released a mobile guideline app that will allow us to push out updates to stay on top of all of these various medication issues we've been facing. You can find the download links on our website at regionsems.com. From Oakdale Fire and all of us at Regions EMS, be smart, be safe, and be professional.